It is not every day that you get to hear a ninja investor talk about how he builds his bank one loan and one house at a time. Stay tuned. Well, we are back here on Note School TV like we are every single Wednesday at 11.05 Central Time. So make sure you're joining us. If you're already here, hey, welcome to the show. Really glad you're here. Would love to get a hello or uh, a comment in the uh, in the, the chat or the question box or the comment box, depending on what you're streaming this thing on. Uh, would love to just hear you say hello. Glad you're joining. Tell us where you're from. Um, as always, if you're somebody who's uh, just joining us, man, I hope this video provides a lot of value to you. If you like it, you learned something, man, click that thumbs up button. As always, subscribe to the channel if you want more content. And probably specifically for this show, make sure you're clicking that bell notification. By clicking that bell, what it does is it, it sends you an alert to your phone, or your iPad, whatever you're watching this on, say, hey, they're going live in 30 minutes. They're going live in just a little bit. And it gives you a little bit of notice to kind of prepare some things to get ready to jump in the show. Say hello, just like Mick and Chris and everybody. Uh, we got people from all over the country, so it's really, really great. Today is a fascinating show um, that I'm hoping will kind of pull back the curtain on what scalability looks like and really kind of introduce you to some other concepts that maybe you never even thought about. Um, if you're brand new to, to notes or, or, or seller financing or, or maybe even to note school as a whole, uh, and you're trying to figure out what that next step is, what is what does it need to look like for you? You can always go to noteschool.com slash TV to learn a little bit more about kind of what your next step needs to be, right? And we'll try to get you going in the right direction. Before we jump into the news, I got to say, hey, stick around. At the very end of this, what we're going to do is we're going to actually have an after party. And what an after party is, is it just allows us to kind of slow down a little bit, get a little bit more casual, go off script, if you will, and really address your questions. And how does that work? That works like this. As we go through the show and you have a question, type it in the question box. If we can't answer it during the show, guess what? We're gonna talk about it in the after party. So if you got thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, type them in that chat box, type them in that uh, comment box. And as we're getting started here, feel free to click the share button where you're at and send that link to friends and colleagues and other investors that you think it would be valuable information for their business. Share it, have them jump on with us or they can always catch it later. But uh, and that's that, right? So let's kind of dive in. I want to jump in uh, to the news with our good friend Joe. Brian, how are you? I'm good. With the latest in the news, breaking news from o Okeechobee, Florida. We got Joe Barnard, Florida. By golly, that's right, man. So, Brian, some great stuff in the news today. I want to get okay. through this so we can get our, our guest in here today. So, Fed's reverse repo program sees demand soar to just under $1 trillion overnight. This came out last Friday. And so, back in the day, right, there was something called QE, quantitative easing, where the banks could literally go in and the GSEs, government-sponsored enterprises like Fed, Freddie, Fannie, and so on, and they could borrow money from the Fed in overnight funds. Well, Brian, today, or actually last Friday, um, well, looks like markets are flush with cash. So here's what it looks like. Overnight demand for the federal for the Fed's reverse repo program reached a record of nine hundred and ninety one point nine billion dollars, meaning that 90 counterparties, banks, U.S. housing giants, Fannie, Freddie and money market funds, they put their they have an overabundance of cash. So they put it they park it with the Fed in overnight funds, and they earn, oh, a half a percent on that money overnight, right? And you know, Brian, we've been talking since really last summer when uh, it came out that the uh, uh, there was almost $4.8 sitting in, uh, in money market funds, right? And so this, uh, it's, it's gone down a little bit now, but earlier in June, the demand for this facility 
reached 775, 775.8 billion and then continued to climb to the $1 trillion mark. And the Fed anticipates that uh, actually it'll be back up to about four, it's up about to $4 trillion is what is sitting in uh, in dry or in money market accounts at this point. So instead wow. of borrowing, the banks are putting that extra demand, extra cash back in. Here it is right here, which have been flooded this year with cash list holding above $4 trillion. So that's a bunch of money, right? Absolutely. And then lumber prices dive more than 40% in June, biggest monthly drop on record. Lumber prices uh, fell 40% in June, dating back. They haven't been that low since 1978. And good news is, well, that uh, it went from a high uh, of, uh, what was it, 1675, 1670.50 yeah. per thousand board feet. And right now, and you can see where the high was here in May. And right now it's sitting at about $710 a board foot. So lumber prices are finally heading down as it says right here, the great lumber bubble of 2021 has popped. So that is the news today. And, uh, you know, we've been talking about this about uh, the dry cash sitting around between money sitting in money market accounts and money sitting in uh, self-directed IRA, IRA accounts. And it's, it's, there's, the markets are flush with cash. So guys, I am going to bring on our fearless leader, chief visionary, Mr. Eddie Speed. Hey guys, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Very good, man. Very good. Everything is beautiful. Fourth of July was, it popped. That's all I can say, man. It popped. <laughs> Pardon the pun. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, good time. Actually, it's not very hot here in Texas, uh, pretty ironically. Not our normal weather. So uh, a lot of fun outside. Uh, glad everybody is back with us and safe. And Joe, I think it's interesting on our lumber you know, an interesting little fun fact, Joe, that you probably don't know is our guest today, his father is an expert, 40 years experience in the lumber business. No kidding. Wow. No kidding. That's a fact. And uh, he has been one of the people that I've used as sort of a resource asking, like, what are we, where are we headed and stuff? So anyway, pretty interesting about lumber and uh, the uh, Fed funds thing. And yes, there we are sitting as a country. We're sitting on a lot of dry cash. You know what? You want to know why that is, Brian? People are looking for a bargain. <laughs> and they're having a hard time investing in a bargain. That's right. Yeah. Y'all, we have a great guest today. Uh, could not say enough about this guy as a business guy, as a family man, uh, and just a good dude. And uh, I've known his partner for a very long time and known him very well for about the last 10 years. So we have had quite a good run together. And um, um, well, let's bring him up. I want to introduce you guys to Mr. Mike Powell. Hey, how's it going? Hey, bud. How are hey, you? Mike. Good, good. Mike, you're from San Antonio. Yep. And so tell us a little bit about your business and your partner and kind of what you guys do a little bit. So my uh, my business partner is a, a little known guy named Mitch Steven. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's, uh, he's known across the industry a little bit. Uh, he uh, Him and I partnered up uh, about 10 years ago in 2011, 2012. He had been doing owner financing and, and, uh, and lending for many, many years before that. I think you and him started doing stuff together in the 90s, correct? That's it. Yep. One on 30 years. And um, we partnered up and started doing owner financing and carrying notes since about 2011, all over San Antonio and within about an hour of San Antonio. So you guys have, uh, Mike, I bought a thousand portfolios of seller finance notes. So pretty much anybody's ever carried a thousand notes. I probably know them, right? Just a small world business. I don't know a better operator than you. I appreciate that. That's that's very humbling. Uh, you you just you you got it figured out. You are you're clear about one thing. Your seller financing to gain a customer for your bank 
you're not seller financing to get rid of your property. Yeah, we're, we're not we're not addicted to those big cash returns. You know, like if you're a flipper or a or a wholesaler or a guy who creates notes and then sells them the next the next day or the next month. You know, we we've never been geared towards selling notes. We have sold a few, but we have probably sold less than five percent of our portfolio over the last ten years. Um, we're like you said, we're geared to build a bank. We're we're we ne I never thought about it that way until about this year when you and I were having that conversation. But we we truly are more of a small bank and we're lending. Well, one thing that you told me way back when we first met was you said, do you want to own your do you want to have a job or do you want to own a portfolio? And that kind of resonated. And we're very careful about our lending and, and who we put in homes. And yeah. and it's paid off tremendously, you know, through COVID, you know, for the last year, we've only had two foreclosures, which is unreal. Yeah, Mike, I, I would say one thing, you know, I've known a lot of operators, you know, seller financing probably should have never been put in Dodd-Frank because it's not, we're not a bank or some mega institution. You and I have spent thousands of dollars and seem like thousands of hours on the seller finance coalition side, both at the state level and the, and the national level with lobby efforts and stuff. And thank you for your commitment to do that. Interestingly, you've done all that with laws that probably wouldn't personally benefit you, by the way. No, not at all. <laughs> um, that's pretty crazy, Joe, right? A guy spends yeah. that much money and time to go protect the industry. Exactly. Even though he's probably such a big operator, he wouldn't be protected. But I want to talk a little bit about why you like the seller finance space. Like, what is it? A guy that's done, you guys have done cumulatively now 33,000 notes? Yeah, at least 3,000 3, to 3,500, something like that. So that's a lot of notes. Why? Why did you pick notes? Now, you, you sort of stepped into Mitch's business, but you let me just let me be clear with everybody. You're a heck of an operator. I have the highest respect for you as an operator and running, you know, operationally the day to day of the business. You let Mitch stay on Facebook. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's a little better on Facebook than I am. <laughs> but but I want to go back to the core of it. What drove you to this model and why, why does it matter? One second. Sorry about that. This, this guy's got, hey, we ought to take a call right here, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go buy something, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I, I chose this model. I, I, uh, I got out of college. I'd done real estate in college. I sold sold real estate, did a lot of commercial real estate in college and worked for a lot of investors. And I decided getting out of college that it was time to become an investor instead of watching them make all the money while I sat on the sidelines getting a paycheck. And so I got in and I thought, man, I want to own all these rentals. Well, I had one. And I think you and I are probably diagnosed by the same doctor. I'm highly allergic, <laughs> highly allergic to rentals. Um, I don't have the the patience or the tolerance to, to own a lot of rental houses, but I knew I wanted to be in the, in the single family business, mostly because people got to have somewhere to live. People don't have to have a commercial property. They don't have to have certain things, but they have to have somewhere to live. And that was kind of my theory behind why I wanted to be in single family residential. And so I uh, got in with a guy who sold me a house on the, on the East side of San Antonio at my first house, I bought it for 16,000 bucks. And, uh, tried to, you know, was fixing it up to rent it out. And the guy said, no, you should owner finance it. You should get a hold of this guy. He teaches it. And I, I got a hold of Mitch and, and that's kind of how I got into it. And, and I realized I really liked carrying paper and I like the flexibility of the lifestyle of carrying paper. You know, I watch all these other people answering phone calls, you know, or, or paying out all their profits to a, a not a servicer, but a property manager and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, once I put pen to paper that, you're not making any money on those rentals. All my friends weren't making any money. So I steered way more towards the note space. So I want, I want to talk about that. You know, you, you've mentioned two models um, and you and I have been in a number of masterminds, very high volume operators in there. Uh, but you and I have a theory about what we would call getting the juice out of the lemon, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there's sort of two other options. You can flip houses or you can keep them and rent them. Why do you feel like seller financing is the ultimate juice out of the lemon? So for me, it was you, I like cash flow. I like security and I like cash flow. Um, 
you, you can get cash flow out of rentals. If you get them to a point where they're paid down far or they're free and clear, you can get some cash flow out of rentals. So I like that side of it. Um, but I also like the ability to be able to sell anytime I wanted, which is what you can do with your flipping. You know, I could sell these notes and get a lot of cash if I ever needed to. So I had an asset that was easily tradable, just like as if I was flipping, but I had the cash flow we wanted as well. And I could build a lifestyle that I wanted based off that cash flow. That's great. Yeah. All right. So it all starts out with good ingredients, right? You, you can't, you can't five star restaurant can't make an unbelievable, you know, meal unless it has great ingredients. Right. And so the, the, the ingredient to start with is clearly the guy that's going to owe you the money. Right. Now we, Joe and I refer to this as a penalty box buyer. Right. And I think that resonates, but it, it's not a buyer of last resort. Right. And so I want, to know, I, want, I want to talk a little bit about that filter that you have, that process. Who is that guy that needs private financing that, w- that you are confident will pay you for a long period of time? Well, so so the, the first thing that I want to say on this, especially for everybody out there, because they ask us all the time how we pick our buyers and, and how we filter them down. When I, the first thing we do is we set up we set a price on a house and we set a down payment. Don't and I tell my salespeople, don't call me if they don't have the down payment. I don't want to hear about the guy that's five hundred short. I don't want to hear about the guy that's a dollar short. Don't call me if they don't have the down payment. So that's the first place we start at. I'd rather let a house sit vacant for six months to get the right guy, then put the wrong guy in there. So don't call me without the down payment. That's the biggest key. We average somewhere between 15 and 20%. By the time they do the down payment, closing costs and uh, insurance, all that kind of stuff, they're they're usually about 15 to 20% into the house. That's, That's a strong buyer for us. I don't take anything less, I won't do it. I might work something out if, if the house is a wreck and we decide not to fix it up or something like that, but, but, on average, we're 15 to 20% down. So that's the first place we start on buying on our buyers. We're kind of in a, in a, you know, um, beautiful space here in, in San Antonio because we're not all the way down in the Valley where I grew up. Um, but, but we're not, you know, up towards Dallas. So you, you kind of have a, a better price range of houses and stuff. You're not, you're not bottom of the barrel, but you're not, you're not top either. So, we're in a really beautiful spot where we have good buyers with still some, some reasonably priced stuff. And that's really helped us on finding our buyers because we're in a fairly large city. I think we're top 10 in the country on city size. And um, we've, Mitch has been doing it here, you know, almost 30 years and I've been doing it within the last 10 and we've built a reputation around here as far as, as selling owner finance homes and being good to good to our buyers being fair, honest people. And um, so we start with reaching out to the community. I've got a lot of realtors where they specialize in owner finance. They bring us a lot of people. And then we've got our own sales team. And I've built a Facebook page on that sells our homes. We've got 10,000 followers. And we do a, we do some teaching on there. We explain how to, how to buy an owner finance home, what to look out for, all that kind of stuff. We do some teaching on there. And that's really boosted up our followers and and having people more prepared when they come to buy a house from us. Um, but our, our sales team's very ingrained with the community in San Antonio and, and very ingrained with the, the owner finance community. And that's made a huge difference for finding that right buyer. Yeah. You guys have championed um, the deserving buyer, right? I mean, and, they, and there's such a difference between you and I've met a lot of people that seller finance and really, did not think in terms of, you know, holding out for the right buyer and the market, you know, in the last year, Mike, the market's left so many people behind. I mean, about 30% of the average, about 30% of the people that could get a conventional mortgage before the virus couldn't get one in a in about a year and a half period of time. Right. Yeah. So that's it. That's a big thing. So I want to talk about the life effect. And when we go to do lobby efforts, for the seller finance coalition and you and I've been in many congressmen and senators offices, right? Uh, both at the state and federal level. We, we don't talk about us, right? Who do we talk about? We talk about the buyer and, and the, the reason we need to talk about the buyer with these people is they don't understand not being able to afford a mortgage. They're sitting in a big time office at, at either the state capital or the United States capital. And they, they can't comprehend people not being able to get a, get a mortgage because of, 
you know, one example is because she had cancer six years ago and it destroyed her credit. You know, they, they can't comprehend that person. They don't, they don't hang out in those crowds. They don't see those types of people. So we have to start with the buyer with them because that's, if, if you can't get them to understand that, they're not going to understand the concept ever. <laughs> the saying that we have is seller permit, seller financing provides home ownership for people that are outside that what conventional lending will make a loan on. And there's such a gigantic hole in that market. So you guys have, I think you think, I think you've really championed it as good as anybody. So Mike, I want to talk, I want to move just a little bit in the direction. You guys have been active house buyers, active house fixers, buy, fix, resell with seller financing, but you've moved your asset class into other things. And I want to talk about that and why you've done that. Yeah, we've, uh, I guess about maybe, maybe about three years ago, we moved heavier into land. Um, we were doing a lot of land, breaking up land, owner financing it. That It's a desperate need for people. A lot of people have homes or can have the capability of building their own homes, things like that, but they couldn't get the, the land needed to do it. So that was a huge one for us. Um, we've, we've done very well with it over the last three years. We've, we've pivoted from 100% houses to probably about 50-50 land and houses right now. Um, it's, it's less competitive than the house market, which is good. We have the capability because of um, the backing we have and all that kind of stuff. We have more capability to do it than your average investor. So it sets us apart a little bit from some of those other people. Um, and then we've also done a lot with mobile homes. You know, as we saw with lumber prices and, and, and building prices and lot prices, everything's skyrocketing so fast. I truly believe the last form of affordable housing is in your mobile homes. Um, we, uh, we do a lot of land mobile packages. Uh, Eddie, you've probably seen a hundred thousand of them. Uh, we do our own subdivisions. Sometimes, sometimes we find individual lots, but we're doing a lot of our own subdivisions, putting mobiles on land. We became a mobile home dealer and, been financing our own rather than going through 21st Mortgage or Vanderbilt or one of these other big mobile lenders where we've created our own financing for mobile and land packages. So you so you have a a piece of land, you break it up, you you put the road in, you put the utilities in. Now they own an individual lot, call it one acre, right? And then you go put a brand new uh, manufactured house on that land and you sell them a home land package. Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. That's it. And what, yeah. what's the typical, what would that, what would that property sell for Mike? So a single wide, uh, anywhere from a hundred and 110 to 130. And then a double wide's a uh, usually about 150 to 180. You know, they call it their affordable housing. Well, that's what I was going to get to. What what would their monthly payment be? <clears throat> Let's just say on the double wide, on the big one. What would their on the big be? one? The max is about sixteen fifty, seventeen hundred bucks a month for a you know brand new three bedroom, two bath double wide on an acre. So, Joe, I've heard this said ten thousand times in my career. Living on this one acre in this manufactured home, a guy's a contractor. He's a whatever, right? Yeah. He says, I don't raise my kid in a concrete parking lot. There you go. It's unbelievable. You know, we, we sell them and then you'll drive by two because we've got them all in a row and you sell one and we'll go into the subdivision. We'll drive by and all this, you know, the guy that moved in a week ago has already got one cow, two donkeys, a chicken coop. You know, <laughs> we're, we're, we're selling the ranchette. <laughs> yeah. We're selling the dream of, of these people being able to have a ranchette or a lot of times businesses, a lot of our, our, penalty box buyers are contractors or things like that who don't, who have the income that they can't show it on paper. And, uh, you know, they might have a roofing business and they got eight trucks. Well, they can't park eight trucks in town and to go have a home and then go buy a commercial space to park all your trucks doesn't work for them. So that's a, a lot of our buyers do that kind of thing. So it works out really well for, for our people to be on that, the larger lots. So Mike, I'm going to do you like Barbara Walters, right? I'm going to, now that I've got you all warmed up and relaxed, now I can ask you a couple of hard questions, right? How many, how many seller finance notes do you think you'll do in the next 12 months? I think probably about a hundred to 120. We shoot for the hundred mark every year, but we'll, we'll do somewhere between hundred and 120. If I can get another subdivision done, we'll, we'll up it to 200. 
That's great. Yeah. So. And you now have a servicing business. You, you not only service your loans, but you service other people's loans. We do. We do. We, uh, we got a company called Moat Note Servicing. Um, we, we were servicing all of our own notes for years and years because we weren't happy with, with different servicers. We tried tons of different servicers and we just figured out that they're not in the business. They're in the note servicing business. They're not in the owner financing business. So we never agreed on how things should be serviced or how things should be handled. And, you know, when we were with a servicer, I still had a full-time girl on staff running, running our stuff. I'm like, this doesn't make sense. So we brought it all in house. We did that, did that for years. And people constantly would ask us to, to service for them and, and that kind of thing. So we started doing it a little bit and, and it's taken off. It's done very well. It's a good business. Um, but it's really good because we get to help people out with servicing their loans the way we service ours, which we've, we've got a, a good track record with our servicing on our personal stuff and it's working really well for other people. So it's, it's been, it's been a different experience, but it's been fun. <laughs> primarily in Texas. Primarily in Texas. We're, we're in some other States, but primarily in Texas. Yeah. And I wanted to talk one, one more thing before we, before we wrap it up. And that is the name of your, your, of your holding company. The name of your holding company is Moat Management, right? Yes, sir. How in the world did you pick such a name? <laughs> so um, I'm sure everybody's, you know, or a lot of people on here have heard of Mitch's book, My Life in a Thousand Houses. If you haven't read it, please read it. It's, it's, I'm not saying it because you're my business partner and, you know, one of the best guys I know, but his book is phenomenal for the young entrepreneur. But he had a theory in there called the, the Moat Theory. And I'm not sure if he got it from somewhere, but he had one called the moat theory where you, you can, you build your moat around your castle. You've got your castle. You don't ever risk that money. That money sitting inside your castle. You build your, your cash flow or your, or your reserves. And you don't, you don't risk that money in the castle. You can run out and risk other money, but you always leave that alone. So when we started doing business together, we, we said we were going to build our moat first. And that's how we came up with moat management. That's a great, that's a great lifestyle to live with in a mindset. Well, Mikey, if you can hang around, we'll have an after party. If guys have, want to ask you some questions about maybe your servicing company or some stuff like that, you guys stick around. Mike will have some information on that. And, um, and just, uh, it'd be a good opportunity if you guys want, just want to lean in a little bit and have a chance to talk to one of the best operators I know in the market, Mr. Mike Powell and his partner, Mitch. So, uh, Brian, we're going to let you circle up and take us, take us home and, uh, we'll see you on the backside. Yep. Man, that sounds. Well, if you're wondering who our sponsor is, it is Notes Direct and the Feeding Frenzy Friday. That's who Note School TV is sponsored by. It allows us to keep this thing going, keep bringing the best content we can, uh, engage with other people just like Mike, and continue to push the best information and education across the web. Um, Notes Direct is a place where you can simply buy note assets, right? If you're trying to find a place uh, to be able to buy notes, that's where you're going to do it. And if you're trying to figure out which note is for me, that's what the playlist called Feeding Frenzy Friday is for. So you can go to the YouTube channel, Note School's YouTube channel, and there's a playlist there called Feeding Frenzy Friday. And each week we take a note from Notes Direct and we break down some of the concepts of it to better uh, explain to you what it is you're looking at as well as help you better master your level of due diligence to be able to build your confidence. Ultimately, click that buy button. You can buy a note as easy as you could buy a pair of shoes on Amazon and ultimately move forward to build your wealth in the note business, right? And, and you might end up being just like Mike to where you're saying, look, the rental game, I'm, I'm just allergic to rentals. And so maybe this note concept is something I should be entertaining, right? So it's a really great way uh, to kind of take those next steps. Um, before we jump forward into the after party, I see a lot of questions, a lot of comments on here. I even see some people have shared uh, this video. So that's really great. If you know investors who, uh, you maybe you know somebody who's allergic to rental properties and they need to hear this uh, conversation, man, click share and send it over to them, do them a favor 
tell them they owe you a cup of coffee or something sometime, right? Um, as always, we're always going to be here on uh, on Wednesdays at 11.05. And if you're trying to figure out, again, those next steps, please go to notes.com slash TV to learn a little bit more about what that needs to look like for you. We want to try to help you the best we can. And if you're somebody who just, you need immediate help, you're saying, I'm in the middle of a deal. I need to figure out what direction to go. I need to increase my knowledge and, and really grow quickly in, the, in my knowledge base, uh, then go to noteschool.com and there's a contact us tab. And when you click that, you can fill out your information. Someone from the team will reach out uh, and just see how we can help you, right? Whatever that looks like for you. Um, if you could stick around as we move forward to the after party, I would love to see you on the other side. Come hang out with Mike, with Eddie, with Joe and me, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more. If not, hey, as always, we'll catch you next Wednesday at 11.05 Central Time. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you then. <clears throat> Well, Mike, thank you so much for uh, for jumping on here and, and time. listen. It's uh, I think you've you've summed up. I think the best phrase. I've been trying to say this for a long time. I, I've told Eddie years ago that I'm struggling with rental properties. It's just I just don't have the skill set. But really, what I think it is is it's an allergy. You know, I just I start scratching and <laughs> losing money, and so I think that's a better way to describe it. Yeah, I've been allergic to them for years. I can't get near them. <laughs> yeah, I'm just glad it's not me. It's not just me anyway. Um, well, well, we had a lot of things. Eddie, did you want to jump in and, and say something specific before I start addressing some of these things? Um, no, I, I knew that we'd have some people with some questions and stuff. And Mike, I think you did a great job of really kind of summarizing the, the movement in the business. Uh, Mike and I um, are involved in sort of a special little group that we all do land together. We have a lot of common friends and relationships that we do in that regard. And uh, so we're, we're very helpful. Mike is a, Mike is just a jam up smart operator. Um, he's built, he's probably the best on Facebook selling property of anybody I've ever heard of. Um, he's just got it figured out and uh, does a great job. But uh, so a couple of things I know, Mike, uh, people are asking about how to get a hold of you guys, Mitch's book and stuff. And so, uh, if we can, we can uh, do that and put it in the show notes, it would be awesome. And, uh, just so, cause I want to make sure that if anybody, you know, wants to hear from you guys that they know how to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, his, his books on Amazon, my life in a thousand houses, that's his first one. And he's got, he's got two others, the art of owner financing and, um, I can't remember the other one. That guy, that guy's so creative. He's always, he's always writing. So, <laughs> but the, the, my life in a thousand house is an unbelievable book for anybody that hasn't read it, but it's on Amazon. Yeah. Love it. it is great. In fact, there's a, there's a note buyer in that book, by the way. There is. <laughs> <laughs> That's from a long time ago. All right. I love it. I love it. Yeah. We'll, we'll put a link down to uh, your Facebook page and stuff as well. So people can be checking that out. And we'll get that from you yeah. um, as we move forward. What's cool, Mike, is even though you're in San Antonio, the beautiful part about seller financing, creative financing, the note business is it can be very market agnostic, right? This isn't just a San Antonio strategy. That's and right. what's, what's great is we've got people from Colorado and Florida, I, Arizona, Iowa. I saw uh, Brooklyn uh, is here. Uh, I mean, and, and then we've got Edwin out in Odessa. Edwin's always on, always on and always on time. It seems like, and so we've got some West Texas boys on here as well. So it's, it's, it's always nice to be able to hear content as an investor. That's like, Oh my gosh, this works for me. Right. Um, and so it's, it's very powerful, um, to be able to, to talk about one specific concept that's very relatable. And, you know, Brian and, and guys, it's, uh, you know, a lot of people think about this as, oh, i got to live in a small town to do this. You know, Mike, you live in San Antonio, like you said, one of the top 10 largest cities in the United States, and you've carved that niche out. And, and the thing that I love about it is you have the ability or you guys have taken that and you kind of help folks one house at a time, right? I mean, you put them out there and you put them in a house and it changes people's lives. And, and I just I love that. I love uh, that. That it's that unbelievable what it does for people's lives. It, it, it's you know I, I can't. I've had hundreds of people crying on our desk as they as they're closing, 
But any what's the other, you know, we didn't, we didn't touch on this on there, but I haven't seen seller financing not work anywhere. Um, you know, it just depends on how creative you're going to get with it. Sometimes it's true owner financing. Sometimes it's uh, deed, uh, contract for deed, whatever. But financing will work anywhere. I, I haven't had it anywhere that it hasn't worked as long as you can get creative. Yeah. Yeah, that's the that's the key to it. You're gonna to have to do it different ways, but you can do it a lot of different ways. So different markets will dictate that. Mike, here's what I want you uh, to leave us with, and because here is I it's, it's I don't get people of your experience level as a guest on the show every week, right? Because they just don't exist. And uh, I want you to pour some wisdom into our audience of what you've noticed, like what, like people that you've seen that have not done a great job at seller financing and people that have done a great job at seller financing, what disciplines do we need to leave here and know that we must possess? The the biggest difference I see in, in guys who have portfolios and guys who have a job is the guys who have portfolio invest back into their business. They don't live out of their business. You know, it's, it's I'm sure it's like that for a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, businesses out there, but I see a, a lot of guys who get three, four, five notes. They get a little bit of cash flow. They've got the brand new car already. They, you know, Mitch and I didn't take a true paycheck from the company for the first seven years. Um, we we built the business for seven years. Uh, you know, we we got paychecks as down payments came in, but it kept us hungry. That kind of thing. Um, but we weren't on a true salary, anything like that, for the for a long, long time. We reinvested into the business to build. Um, build our moat, build a brand that could, could sustain going through hard times, you know, like, like through COVID, you know, it's shut down for three months. We, we didn't hurt us at all. Everybody, tons of people called me up panicking. How are you going to pay your lenders? I said, well, we got two years of reserves. And they're like, Oh my gosh, I've already called my lenders and told them they might not get paid. And um, you know, I got a ton of that stuff right off the bat on, on COVID and, and not having that was kind of proof to us that we, we built the business correctly. And that's how we did it. We reinvested in the business and, and we built a very solid portfolio. The other thing I did is I could care less about creating a thousand notes a year or 10 notes a year. I want good margins. I don't want, you know, the banks can have, have the, the low margins. I want big margins. Mitch and I have been very, very strict on our numbers for years. We're still very, very strict. If it doesn't fit in our model, we just don't do it. And that's that's been a big part of building a very good solid portfolio for us. Man, that is that is some perils of wisdom. So let me say this, audience. Financial modeling is what allowed Mitch and Mike to do that. Like if you're thinking I'm just going to run a business for seven years and never cash a check and never make any income, we we fully understand you can't do that. But it's financial modeling and it's some of the smart things that they did in their disciplines that they just weren't sucking all the money out of the company. But yet you were you could do things to live to fight another day. And the other thing is, Brian, Mike started out having to buy a used Ferrari. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somewhere he's talking about the Hot Wheels. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it was a used Hot Wheels. That's how broke I was. Big, big oh. used Hot Wheel market, huh? <laughs> I didn't realize it was out there. That is fantastic. Well, Mike, I really appreciate you coming on, man. A lot of wisdom, and it, and it really does mean a lot, uh, really, to all of us, just to hear uh, kind of the life cycle, right? The the whole story, not just the you know the talking head who's like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm I'm doing all these things, and or I've done all these things. It's, it's being able to take somebody through the process of, yeah, we started with one house at a time, one borrow at a time. We had to go out and help one, uh, one person you know, achieve home ownership one person at a time. And that became scalable. And it became scalable because you're not always throwing all your money back into fixing the roof, fixing the air conditioning, turning over the property, right? It allowed you to preserve a lot of that capital. And as you just said, reinvest that. And that's a scalable model, right? And that's ultimately what everyone watching this, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for something that yes, makes me money, whether it's money now or money later, but also is something that's sustainable and scalable so that you could be the person on the on No School TV talking about, yeah, you know, or like Mitch says, my life in a thousand houses. Obviously, he's bought a lot more than a thousand houses now, but it always starts with one house at a time. So it's it's, it's not just a, a message of wisdom and knowledge, but man, of encouragement to know that like this is very doable and this isn't a pie in the sky. 40 years from now, I might get there. 
you know. So really appreciate you coming on. Uh, yeah, as always, yeah, blast. Yeah, man, it's been so good. Uh, hopefully, you guys are watching the show. You really got some stuff, uh, man. If there was something that really stood out to you, type it in the comments. Uh, it'd be really encouraging for Mike. And as always, man, don't don't forget to share this stuff uh, with other people. Have that kind of go giver attitude, uh, and and get this content out there so it helps other people um, as well. As always, we'll be back, like I said, next Wednesday. So we'll catch you then at eleven oh five Central Time. And if you still need help, you're trying to figure out, hey, this is for me. I just need to take my next step. Go check out this link right here, noteschool.com slash TV. And here in just a little bit, you can check the description notes. We're going to have links to all the stuff that we talked about in the description, and we'll help you move forward. We'll catch you guys on the other side. See you. Bye-bye.